Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. So continuing our discussion on the so-called crisis in cosmology, let's talk more about this latest announcement from the Keck Observatory, which describes the latest verification of the anomalous accelerating expansion rate of the universe. For the first time, scientists have attempted to estimate the expansion rate using a new method involving gravitational lensing. Now, the concepts behind the standard ideas about gravitational lensing is something that's been discussed at some of the annual Thunderbolts conferences. For example, Dr. Edward Dowdy is a laser optics engineer, and in fact, he was a NASA physicist. And he has presented his case on the importance of plasma in understanding the phenomena that scientists attribute to so-called lensing in space. So while fundamentally, why don't you explain the Electric Universe interpretation of the effects that astronomers do observe and which they describe as, quote, gravitational lensing? The concept of gravitational lensing is uh, faulty uh, the very beginning because it assumes that gravity has an effect on space. It doesn't. It's an electric force. It's a dipolar force, just like magnetism. And if uh, that dipole electric force were able to warp space with the powerful magnets we have today, you should be able to see distinct lensing effects using magnets. We don't. Gravity doesn't affect light directly, but it can by modifying the density of the ether. The ether is all pervasive. It's the substrate of the universe. It's the medium through which light travels. It's the medium through which the gravitational and magnetic forces and the electric force travel. It behaves like any medium in the presence of a gravitational field because it's a material medium that has to be material of vanishingly small mass, which indicates that there's possibly neutrinos involved. They will respond to gravity just like any other material medium, and in this case, like a gas, and form an atmosphere about a celestial object. And that atmosphere can refract light so that you will get lensing, but it's got nothing to do with gravity per se. It's the effect of gravity on the environment of that body. So yes, you can get gravitational lensing, but the concept that they're using is invalid. And principally, because of this idea that redshift indicates that these objects that they're seeing near a low redshifted galaxy are far away is incorrect. All it means is that they're younger than the object that's in that center of that view. And what do we find most often close to galaxies? Quasars, redshifted quasars. And they are, in Halton Arp's research, the offspring of an active galaxy. Galaxies beget baby galaxies, and they form initially as a quasar of low mass and high redshift and low brightness. And their brightness, their mass, and their redshift all change, become closer to their parent over time. And as a result, they become companion galaxies of various kinds. So he gives a genealogy. He shows an almost biological aspect to galactic formation. And so when we see these objects in distant so-called lensed objects, what we must be looking at is a, an active galaxy surrounded by some of its redshifted offspring. Because they're fired off in episodes, they often have different, slightly different quantized redshifts. If they're misinterpreted, which they're being done here by these people, they can be interpreted in a way which may appear to give some credence to the distance scales. But the distance scales, as Halton Arp has shown, are completely haywire in modern cosmology. Right. The redshift right. distance relationship is mythical. Arp wrote on the subject of gravitational lensing. He said, you must remember that it was invented for extragalactic objects because that was the only escape from observations which required the physical association of objects of much different redshift. The low mass particle masses, which I've talked about, give rise to a lower luminosity. That gives a rough, higher redshift, fainter apparent magnitude relation for galaxies of different age at the same distance. And he notes here also, and this is something that I picked up, 
This should also apply to the supernova within the galaxies. Of course, this fainter than expected supernova discovery gave rise to the idea that the universe is expanding more rapidly, it's accelerating. But that's sheer nonsense. It means that you don't understand supernova explosions either, which is not a surprise when you think they don't understand gravity. Well, speaking of Halton Arp and our earlier discussion about the nature of quasars, let's talk now about one of the more remarkable discoveries in the space sciences in recent months. In September of this year, in a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal, a team of scientists reported their observation of, quote, six quiet galaxies shifting into quasars in a period of time that is literally thousands of times more rapid than standard cosmology can explain. I'll read to you briefly from a science alert report. In a spectacular fashion, six galaxies have just undergone a huge transformation in a matter of mere months. They've gone from relatively peaceful galaxies to active quasars, the brightest of all galaxies blasting vast amounts of radiation out into the universe. Such changing look transitions are usually observed occurring between different types of safer galaxies. These safer transitions were what the team set out to study. Now, one of the authors of the study states, Instead, we found a whole new class of active galactic nucleus capable of transforming a wimpy galaxy to a luminous quasar. Theory suggests that a quasar should take thousands of years to turn on, but these observations suggest that it could happen very quickly. It tells us that the theory is all wrong. We thought that safer transformation was the major puzzle, but now we have a bigger issue to solve. And of course, as we've reported previously, this isn't the first time that scientists have observed, quote, impossibly rapid changes in quasars. So, Wal, why don't you tell us, generally speaking, why these kinds of incredibly rapid cosmic scale transformations are actually expected in the electric universe? I point to the research of plasma cosmologists, which shows that the active galactic nucleus that ejects the quasar are, in fact, plasmoids the most compact form of high energy storage known. The electrical energy poured into the plasmoid from the spiral arms forms a tiny donut shaped object. At some point, the energy density closest to the axis of the plasmoid forces the electrons and protons to collide and form neutrons. Having no charge allows the neutrons to escape from the electromagnetic galactic nucleus in axial jets. It seems that neutrons are nature's Houdinis they only exist as a dance between an electron and a proton for the short time required to escape from the electromagnetic prison of the nucleus of an atom or the nucleus of a galaxy. But in doing so, they give birth to either a new element or a new galaxy, respectively. Nature never does things the hard way. When the neutrons do decay, the freed electrons are held back by the galactic magnetic field more strongly than the heavier protons, which now form a quasar. I proposed that an initially positively charged quasar is therefore followed by a beam of electrons from its parent galaxy, which would explain both the observed quantized redshift and the increase in mass of the quasar as a result of increasing charge polarization within the matter in the quasar as the electrons arrive. Of course, the bursty nature of these outbursts from active galactic nuclei suggests that the electrons may also arrive in bursts, just like the ejections themselves, which would predict and explain seemingly impossibly sudden changes in quasars. Sudden changes on the galactic scale and even on the stellar scale are expected in the electric universe simply because we're dealing with a coherent, connected, electrical system operating in real time in the case of a galaxy across the entire galaxy. And this is because the electric force is instantaneous and the release of stored electrical energy takes place like a sudden lightning bolt, followed by an exponential decay as that energy dissipates into space. And this is behind all sorts of phenomena that are puzzling researchers at present, where they're getting uh, gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts and all sorts of things from seemingly nowhere. And this is another point that Hans Elfane made. Plasma currents that are flowing through space will produce double layers. And these double layers can, if the current density gets too high, actually shut the current off. 
And the result is that the um, energy is suddenly concentrated at that point and there's a sudden burst like a lightning bolt. And it can happen in apparently empty space because these double layers are often in dark mode discharge, as it's called. In the case of galaxies, the plasmoid itself in the laboratory, it's known that uh, the plasmoid forms and the energy that it concentrates when it gets to a certain point at a very high density, the electrons and the protons which are held in that plasmoid, when they're traveling down the core of the donut, is where they're closest together. And that's where the breakdown will first occur. And that breakdown forms a uh, beam of neutrons. In the laboratory, plasmoids are known to be the most copious source of neutrons when they um, break down. So all of this is, can be tested in the laboratory, which is one of the big advantages of the electric universe cosmology over standard cosmology. Well, indeed, and when it comes to cosmological phenomena, I've always felt that the most significant type of discovery is the evidence for physical connections and interactions of objects over unfathomable distances. I've said before that the motto of the electric universe might be, there are no islands in space. And we see this verified more and more frequently. A few months ago, we reported on the discovery of a vast radio emitting filament, which is connecting two galaxy clusters across 10 million light years. And this seems like a dramatic confirmation of a prediction that Anthony Peratt made decades ago, that cosmic scale currents exist in deep space connecting these types of objects. And now, just in the last few weeks, we've seen the report that distant galaxies, which are separated by tens of millions of light years, have been found rotating in synchronicity with one another. A science alert report on that discovery states, the discoveries could force us to rethink our understanding of the universe. And a lead author of a paper on this discovery says, the observed coherence must have some relationship with large-scale structures, because it is impossible that the galaxies separated by six megaparsecs directly interact with each other. But I think what the scientists should have said is that the phenomenon is, quote, impossible under the assumption of an inert and disconnected universe. So, Wal, why don't you shed some light on why, like countless other discoveries, this is not impossible nor surprising in the electric universe? The electric universe has no problem with the synchronization of galaxies over colossal distances, simply because they are all being driven electrically by the same Birkeland current filaments. And the spiral galaxies uh, tend to be strung along them like Catherine wheels on a wire. Both the rotation and the form of a spiral galaxy is explained experimentally and theoretically by plasma cosmologists. And the fact that it's been discovered recently that the rotation of galaxies seems to be somehow strangely similar is all tied up to the fact that they're all being driven electrically by these circuits. And it's just like uh, electric motors in the home. If they're connected to the same circuit, they will all tend to uh, be synchronized in some fashion, either by the number of cycles per second of the power supply. But in the case of galaxies, all of this can be tested and proven in the laboratory. A critical failure of modern cosmology is to assume that gravity is the only force operating on a cosmic scale. Plasma cosmologists for the last 50 years have shown that this is incorrect. Electromagnetic forces dominate on the cosmic scale. Supercomputer simulations have shown that introducing gravity into their electromagnetic models has no effect. This should be no surprise given that compared to the electric force, the force of gravity is effectively zero. This should have been obvious to theorists given that spiral galaxies rotate like the solid disk of a Faraday motor and not a gravitational system where the outer satellites rotate more slowly than the inner. Once again, our Earth-centric view has held back science. Plasma cosmologists showed that spiral galaxies form like Catherine wheels along spiraling intergalactic Birkeland current filaments. It explains both their axial alignments and their rotation. Of course, these recent discoveries should force a rethink of the fundamental understanding of the universe. It should have done so decades ago, but those doing the research have not been trained to see the alternatives. 
which have been available since late last century. Cosmologists are taught that, yes, there is electricity in space, but it doesn't do anything. They are also taught a basic form of plasma physics, which the Nobel Prize winning plasma cosmologist Hans Alfane showed is invalid in space. And the tunnel vision induced by their training prevents modern cosmologists from attending plasma cosmology lectures.